Good evening, and welcome to tonight's John A. Witso Foundation virtual conversation, Church History and the World, the Contributions of Emma Smith, First Lady of the Restored Gospel. The John A. Witso Foundation at the University of Southern California focuses on Latter-day Saint history and culture throughout the world. And these conversations are intended to take topics from history and culture and expand them to a worldwide audience. Our guest this evening is Jennifer Reeder, author of the recently published book, First, The Life and Faith of Emma Smith. I'll introduce Dr. Reeder more fully in a moment, but before doing that, I want to mention that next month's Church History and the World Conversation will feature the Missouri period of Latter-day Saint church history. The Missouri period is one of the more challenging periods of the Joseph Smith time frame, and so we invite you to be present to discuss with our participants during that session important issues relating to the history of the church during that time period. I also want to remind you that previous conversations, including last month's conversation with Steve Harper on the first vision, are available at the John A. Witso Foundation website www.witsofoundation.org. We'd like to remind you of the format for these conversations. We will begin with a conversation between Dr. Reeder and me. I will pose questions to her to initiate the conversation and move it along. Meanwhile, we invite you as audience members to craft your own questions, which we'll begin to address about half or two thirds of the way through the hour. Now let me introduce Dr. Reeder. Jenny Reeder is the 19th century women's history specialist for the church history department of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. She earned a PhD in American history from George Mason University, where she studied American religious history, women's history, and memory and material culture. Her dissertation looks at artifacts commemorating the Nauvoo Relief Society and the creation of a usable past. Jenny has co-edited two books. The first is At the Pulpit, 185 Years of Discourses by Latter-day Saint Women, published by the Church Historians Press. This volume is also available on the Gospel Library app for those of you who have that loaded on your phone. Her second edited volume is Witness of Women, Firsthand Experiences and Testimonies of the Restoration, published by Deseret Book. Her most recent publication, as I mentioned, is titled First, The Life and Faith of Emma Smith, recently released also by Deseret Book. Jenny is the project lead on a collection of over 1,250 known discourses given by Eliza R. Snow, available digitally on the Church Historians Press website with a print volume of selected discourses to be published in the next couple of years. She served in the Italy Catania mission and was an ordinance worker in the Salt Lake Temple before its recent closure for remodeling. She is also the favorite aunt to 13 nieces and nephews and loves to travel, read, and quilt. I have followed Dr. Reeder throughout her career and was happy to, when she became a colleague at the Church History Department in 2013. So to begin this conversation, I'd just like to mention that in my travels around the world over three decades as a historian for the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, I often had the opportunity to field questions from missionaries and church members at various meetings. And some questions occurred maybe once or twice Others occurred very frequently. And one of the most frequently asked questions that I fielded was one essentially that said, tell me about Emma Smith, the wife of Joseph Smith Jr. So Jenny, tell me, why do you think Emma Smith is such an interesting figure to members of the church? I, that's such a great question to start with, Rick. I'm glad that you asked that. I think that Emma is considered a significant person in the history of the church for a couple of different reasons. Not only was she a, a vital part of the beginning days of the early church um, through um, Joseph's death, but she started the Relief Society. She um, 
she produced the first hymn book. And also, we don't know as a church much about her after Joseph's death. There's a lot of um, question and concern about why she didn't come west with the rest of the saints. And it seems to many people mysterious, like what happened to her. So I think that's the big reason. And, and also just that she's, she's seen in a couple of different ways. I think she's often seen as a um, up on a pedestal as like this wonderful elect lady, um, but then she's also disparaged for not coming West and for having a tense relationship with Brigham Young. So I think that's probably the biggest reason for those questions. I mean, another reason is that she is the only woman in the Doctrine and Covenants to have a section devoted entirely to her. Great. Now you've just written a biography as we mentioned earlier. How does first the life and faith of Emma Smith fit in with other biographies about Emma large and small? Oh, that's another good question. Let's talk historiography for a little bit. Um, I think probably the most uh, well-known biography of Emma Smith is The Mormon Enigma um, by Linda Newell and Val Avery. And that was published in 1985, I believe. And they did an excellent job. They, they searched down uh, resources that hadn't been used before and they put together a very compelling book. Um, things have changed a little bit. And I think it's also talking about historiography. I think it's important to realize that that was written and research during the second wave of feminism. And so there were some very significant ideas in their writing and in their presentation of Emma. Um, since then, we've had a few books here and there that um, have talked about Emma. Susan Easton Black has written, I think, two books on Emma. Buddy Youngren has written a book. He's had access to some great resources actually from the Smith family and her children. And they're really helpful and great resources. Um, the Community of Christ has put out a couple of books, specifically Ron Romig, some very small, bigger than a pamphlet, but small um, about Emma and Lucy Mack Smith. And then we also have books written by her ancestors, her descendants, I guess I should say. Gracia Jones has written a few books about Emma. And we also have some popular devotional books written about Emma. There's a really good one actually written by a woman at BYU-Idaho. I can't remember her name right now, but it's actually a pretty good, well-researched book. Now the, and there's also of course been movies about Emma. The most recent was Jane and Emma, it came out a few years ago, which was a fictionalized story of Emma. It was an incredible, she, it, it depicted her in an incredible way, I thought. Um, but of course, we don't know the conversations that she had, particularly with Jane, Manning James. Um, and there's another one that I haven't seen. I think it's called In Her Footsteps or something like that. Um, so there's quite a few things, but I think the thing that makes this book different is the access of information that hadn't been before available, particularly the Joseph Smith papers. So we don't have a lot of words written by Emma, which is unfortunate. Um, I don't know that she kept a journal. If she did, we don't have it. Nobody that I know of has it. Um, we have correspondence that she wrote and the church has some of that. Quite a bit of it is on the Joseph Smith papers website. Um, but the Community of Christ also holds quite a few letters between her and her sons as they're adults and between her and her second husband, Louis Vitamin, that tell a lot. And they were really helpful in preparing this book. And um, also, I want to, I guess I should go even further back. I wanted to mention this. I found a manuscript of a, probably the earliest manuscript of a book on Emma Smith was by a woman named Vesta Crawford. She was a editor of the Relief Society magazine. And this is back in the, I think, 50s or 60s. And um, the book was never published, but the manuscript and all of her records are at the University of Utah Special Collections. 
And the reason why the book was never published is because the church was concerned about the way in which she presented Emma and told her that if she published the book, this is Vesta Crawford, that she would be um, fired from her job and her church membership would be in question. Now I've read through the book and I don't see it as um, explo ex what's the word? exploitive of Emma, but I do, I did find out something really interesting that she was actually, I can't remember how many greats, maybe two, maybe one, granddaughter of Louis Biedemann. And she had in fact joined the church. So I think that's really interesting. And I give credit to her in my book. She gave, she provided some really great information. Thank you. That was a good trip through all the books and films that have recently been prepared. Now, there are a lot of ways to write a book, particularly a biography. You can do it narratively, you can do it topically, you can do it in a sort of expository, analytical way. You've chosen to write first topically. Tell us why you did that. You know, I, I love biographies. I love reading about um, Carol Madsen's biography of Emmeline Wells or Dave Paul's biography of Amy Brown Lyman. And I um, also realize how expansive those biographies are and how much work they take. And Desiree, when Desiree Book asked me to do this, they wanted a book that was accessible to a church facing public, um, but that also was very real. So I also spoke with the General Relief Society presidency as I was preparing um, the research and, and writing of this book. And they asked me to cover a few things that they felt were important. And number one on that list was polygamy. They really wanted me to talk about polygamy. And of course, you know, other topics like the Relief Society and the hymn book. Um, and they also wanted to know about Emma's experience um, as a woman of property, a woman of business, her political activism, stuff like that. So I didn't have a lot of time to write this book. And also I, I did not wanna take away anything from a project that Mark Staker, who's one of my coworkers in the church historic sites of the church history department, he's been planning on writing a, a biography on Emma for years. And um, initially I asked him to do this one with me and it didn't, the timing didn't work out, but I really respect his, his work in fact, he was so helpful in writing this book. So I, that while this is a biography, I chose to write it topically. Not only did it help me manage my time and my resources and to highlight certain aspects of Emma's life, but I also think this is an exciting new way to do history monographs is topically rather than chronologically. I think we can take a deep dive into each of these topics and really explore the context and what it means. And I think we can actually understand them better when we do it that way, that we can, we can look at something that happened or a relationship or an event or an organization um, or a role that Emma had in her life and really explore it across time instead of doing a little bit in each chapter. The one thing um, someone, someone gave me this review was that she was surprised to find polygamy in almost every chapter. Um, and I did try to contain that within the chapter of, on Emma and Joseph. And um, it just is such a huge part of her life. Like it totally affects the Relief Society. It totally affects her life after Joseph died. So um, little things like that do of course pop up throughout the whole book. But I really wanted to do a deep dive into specific um, top topics about Emma. Well, for members of our audience who are interested in Emma Smith and plural marriage, but have not yet had a chance to read the book, can you just summarize for us her relationship with plural marriage? You bet. Um, now, I, I have to tell you about the process that I had for this, because it was both a process of trying to figure out what that what that actually was in all reality, um, where, where there are very few primary sources. And, and if there are sources, they are either written in code, contemporary sources, or there are sources written much later, um, written at a time of urgency. For example, affidavits um, speaking up uh, uh, for the 
Church of Christ Temple Lot case or anti-polygamy federal legislation um, or anger, dismay at an interview Emma gave shortly before her death claiming Joseph didn't practice polygamy. So I really wanted to, to try to get the history of the moment correct, but I also found that as for myself, I needed to understand and come to an explanation of polygamy. And I know I'm inserting myself as an author in here, but um, it's something that I had always struggled with and tried to understand. For example, initially, years ago, when I first read the Nauvoo Relief Society Minutes, I knew that there, was, there were issues with Emma and polygamy. And I knew that she sort of used the Nauvoo Relief Society to speak up about polygamy in a socially appropriate way. And that sort of changed my perspective of Emma. Um, but as I, as I delved into what I knew about her and what I had learned about her and how I felt about her personality, um, I realized, uh, and I also studied uh, the period, the time period. I read Jonathan Stapley's book about the power of godliness. Um, I tried to understand the way that Joseph consistently was progressing in his understanding and delineation of the priesthood and how that developed and the temple over time. And I finally came to a conclusion with the help of Rick with you, many conversations with you, but also the way that Richard Bushman writes about plural marriage in Nauvoo and the way that Kathleen Flake talks about plural marriage in Nauvoo. I really think that initially the idea First of all, I have to say that plural marriage was very different with Joseph Smith than it was years later with Brigham Young. They had almost entirely different practices of plural marriage. Um, but I really believe that Joseph, in his effort to translate the Book of Mormon as well as retranslate the Bible, um, he came to understand the Abrahamic covenant and the house of Israel in a brand new way. And he did that in a way that really opened up this whole new realm of possibility of connecting people together in into kin networks is what Richard Bushman would say or, or into larger families or patriarchal chains and he is the prophet was the head of that chain or dispensation and so if he was able to draw people into his family it expanded the house of Israel that's how he could bring people into this Abrahamic covenant and um, I really think that it's interesting when you look at some of the women that he was sealed to, that they were often women that hadn't been married um, or women who were orphans, or he wanted to find a way with the Whitney's, a way to connect his family and bring their family into his family to connect their families. And I really think that he saw this as a way of of inviting women into a priesthood covenant and giving them access to that priesthood and to the house of Israel. So I think from the beginning, I feel like he just knowing Joseph and Emma, I feel like they talked through a lot of things together and they were very open in their um, understanding. I feel like she really helped him become a prophet and develop his ideas and figure out how to do this restoration thing. Um, and, and I think she was open to that idea. However, when we start seeing all the gossip surrounding polygamy with, with John C. Bennett and others, we see the, the scandal side of it um, and how it starts to employ sex and um, other questionable moral um, problems. Now, Emma, as the president of the Relief Society, had been given a charge to to fight for the moral purity of the women and children of Nauvoo. And she took that charge very seriously. And so as she finds out about polygamy and the expanse of it, um, and that it included many of her dear friends, I think that caused um, a lot of feelings of betrayal and loss of friendship. And I think that she really wrestled with it. And it's a wrestle that she deserved to have. She, um, in section 132, the Lord calls it sort of an Abraham, Abrahamic sacrifice um, in order for her to understand that. So I think it's a, it's a complicated issue. It's not easy to understand. 
Um, I do think an interesting thing um, at the end of her life when she married Louis Vitamin, Louis had been married initially to a woman. They had two daughters and his wife died. Um, and then he married another woman who didn't like his two daughters. And so they separated and sometime in between there, he'd had an affair with the woman who had a child, but the woman kept that child. And so there was no real relationship with him. Um, and then he married Emma and two of his daughters lived in the, in the mansion house for a couple of years. And then he had another affair with a woman in Nauvoo, Nancy Abercrombie. And Nancy had a, a baby boy, Charlie, who was not, she wasn't able to provide for him. So Emma took that little boy into her house and raised him as her own. And he has wonderful memories of Emma. Um, but then Nancy wasn't able to find work. And Nauvoo was not the bustling metropolis that it had been in earlier days. And so Emma brought Nancy into her home to work as a nursemaid. And shortly before her, her passing, she, she called for Nancy and Louis Vitamin to come to her bed. And she made them promise that after she died that they would get married to make Charlie a legitimate son. And so I kind of wonder if this is one of the ways that she reconciles polygamy. She raises, a, raises children from her husband's other wives. Um, we also know that Joseph did not bear any children with any of his plural marriages. Um, and we know that Emma was pregnant when he died. So I think that all factors in. So clearly at the end, they had a relationship that was close enough that she bore his final child after his martyrdom. Right. Emma has tended to be a polarizing figure, particularly in Latter-day Saint history. Why is that? I think the biggest reason is because of her of the tension she experienced with Brigham Young. Um, I think when Joseph died, actually, I think before he died, Brigham was the president of the Quorum of the Twelve. Emma was his wife. And I think they kind of competed for attention, for Joseph's attention and his ear. Um, I believe that Joseph talked a lot of things through his, with his wife and obviously in different quorums and councils and meetings with Brigham Young. And I think that as after the martyrdom and as they sort of tried to piece things together and figure out how they were gonna move on, we see Brigham fiercely protecting the church and Emma fiercely protecting her family. And there's a conflict there and she doesn't come West. And I think that's why there's sort of this attitude or concern about, about Emma. I know that when the Relief Society under Zina Young, the third general Relief Society president celebrated their Jubilee celebration in 1892, that they had planned to hold the celebration in the tab Salt Lake Tabernacle. And they had a portrait of Joseph Smith and a portrait of Eliza R. Snow and a floral key to represent the key that Joseph had turned to the women in the Nauvoo Relief Society. And then there was discussion about whether to hang up a portrait of Emma. Emmeline Wells records in her diary that she um, went to Wilford Woodruff, who was the prophet at the time and the president of the church and expressed her concern about this. And he said, well, of course you should hang up a portrait of Emma. If anyone has a problem with that, have them come talk to me. So I, I love that he was so supportive of her. But it's, it's interesting, as you said, I, um, I've been working on Eliza Arsenal sermons and there's times where she's a little critical of Emma, of course, years later, but then there's also times where she recognizes that she is a significant figure in the Relief Society. So I guess it, a lot of it depends on what's going on in the moment and what the church is being, um, is being attacked with, whether that's federal anti-polygamy legislation or whatever it is, um, it, it shifts. That, that idea of Emma shifts and the relationship with Emma shifts, especially when her sons go on missions to Utah to proselytize for the reorganized Church of Jesus Christ. You mentioned that Emma was the only woman 
who for whom a section of the Doctrine and Covenants was received, section 25. Can you talk to us about Doctrine and Covenants section 25? And in particular, since this is the John A. Winslow Foundation and we, we like to focus on globalizing our messages, mm -hmm. tell us how that would be relevant to people around the world. That's a good question. And I'm glad you asked that. I think my first reaction is, of course, it's relevant because it's in our Doctrine and Covenants. And that's one of our canonized scriptures. Um, and I think I think it's relevant for a couple of different reasons. Um, obviously, it shows the Lord's concern and uh, assignment for, for a woman as a part of the restoration, just as Oliver Cowdery and Martin Harris and um, David and Peter and John Whitmer had received revelations up to this point, and Joseph Knight Sr., we have Emma receiving a revelation. And he, he sort of does the same, the Lord does the same thing in this revelation where he calls her by name, he establishes a relationship with her, that she is his daughter, and that she can receive an inheritance and a crown of righteousness. And then he gives her very specific assignments. She, um, even an office of her calling is to, is to comfort her husband and to be a comforter. And that word really stands out to me now whenever I read it in the Doctrine and Covenants, because I know that was Emma's role. She was, a, she was the first scribe for the Book of Mormon. She helped him um, get the plates um, in this, this chapter, we're also told that she was ordained under his hand to expound scripture and to exhort the church. And I think she does that in two ways, both with the hymns that she collects, which she is told to do in this section, and with the Relief Society and the title that she's given of being an elect lady or a selected or chosen lady. And that title is now often associated with the Relief Society, which is a global women's organization an essential global women's organization of the church. Um, I think we also learn some, some significant things about the Lord. And I think this is global in every sense of the word because we learn what, who he is and what he is. Um, we know that he has a soul that delights in the song of the heart and that he is anxious to bless those that, that sing or pray or worship him. Um, we know that he has um, a great inheritance to give to his children, including a crown of righteousness and being in his presence. We know that there are certain things that Emma is asked to do. While she's asked to lay down the things of the world, she's also called to pick up the, um, the assignments that she's been given and to cleave into her covenants. So she's never left empty handed in any way. Um, I love that he tells Emma not to fear for her husband shall support her in the church. Um, but I think if we read that another way, which I love doing, it's that he, Joseph will support Emma in her role in the church with the Relief Society. Um, and then I think the last verse is so interesting because obviously, it says, I say unto you that this is my voice unto all. So this is the Lord's voice unto all the people of the world, that we have a relationship with him, that we have specific assignments given to us, and that we are part of what President Nelson calls a continuous revelation, but also that we can become sons and daughters of the Lord through baptism and through our covenants, and that we can receive the same inheritance or crown of righteousness and join in his presence. However, I think there's another way that we can look at that last verse. Um, I think that in understanding Emma and her relationship with the Lord and her assignments, this is the Lord saying, this is my voice about Emma and to all of you. You need to understand Emma. You need to, to respect her and recognize her role in this restoration and know that she is such an important daughter to me. Great. Those are good universal messages that I think can be applied throughout the world. Mm -hmm. Now let's get into something a little more particular. In many cultures around the world where I visited, there is a high price attached to formal marriage. For example, in some areas of the world where people tend to organize, at least informally in tribes, there is often a bride price, a price that has to be paid by the couple 
before the couple can formally marry. In the United States, often couples will delay marriage for an extended period of time in order to get enough money to have a fancy reception. Let's talk about Joseph and Emma. How did they decide to tie the knot? And at what point in their life did they do that? I love the story behind this. Um, and I think you're asking an interesting question about uh, global wedding traditions. I can't necessarily speak to those because I'm focused on Emma in the 19th century. But I think we, we can, perhaps in our discussion, take away some comparisons. So first of all, Moroni had told Joseph in their annual appointment um, on the hill that he needed to bring the right person with him. And the first time he met with Moroni, um, his immediate thought, Joseph's immediate thought was that right person would be his older brother, Alvin Smith. However, that year, just a few months later, Alvin became sick and died. And so he met once more with uh, Moroni. This light is kind of weird, how about I scoot over? Um, he met, uh, he continued to meet with Moroni and in 1826, Moroni said, you have one more chance you need to bring the right person. And Joseph didn't know who that right person was. He had met Emma Hale in 1825 when he had gone down to the Harmony area to work and he'd boarded on their farm and was impressed with her intelligence and her um, sincere belief in his experience. Um, but he, so he looked in his seer stone, which was one way that he received revelation and he saw Emma Hale. And he knew that she was the right one, the right one, not only to um, help him procure the plates, but the right one to be a companion to him through his life. And he tells his mother, um, I've been so lonely since Alvin died, and I really think I'm going to get married and I'm going to marry Emma Hale. Now that presented some challenges. Emma's parents, um, her mother, probably more so than her father, Elizabeth Hale, her father was Isaac Hale. Um, she was very uh, Methodist and they were concerned about their daughter and concerned about her livelihood and the way that she would be able to have her own family. Many of their children had already married and had stayed close by in Harmony. And um, many of her, her daughters often married men that weren't entirely educated or wealthy. So it wasn't a matter of Joseph's lack of education or um, lack of wealth that troubled them. It was the fact that he was um, claiming to have these religious visions and to have a, uh, the gold plates that they knew existed, but they weren't allowed to see. And so when Joseph went to um, Isaac Hale to at request his daughter's hand, Isaac said, um, no, you can't. Now it was tradition at that time that when young women got married, that they were married in their father's homes. And, but he wouldn't allow that. Obviously he didn't approve of the marriage. So Emma and Joseph went to uh, New York. Well, Emma met Joseph in New York and she didn't leave her house planning on getting married, but she ended up getting married there by um, Squire Tarbell. And they went immediately from there up to Joseph's family's home. So um, they lived there for a few months and then Emma wrote her father and asked him if he would send her property. Now this is also a time of coverture, um, which we don't, in the United States, we don't, um, we don't practice today, but it was that a woman was covered either by her father or by her husband and she didn't really own property or anything. And Emma's kind of on, kind of on the cusp of, of this change. So she writes her father for permission to get her possessions and bring them to Manchester, New York, where she's residing with Joseph and his family. And her father agrees and sends them up with one of her brothers. But then when the persecution comes to uh, Manchester, Palmyra, Joseph and Emma decide to move back to Harmony. And um, they were there for a couple of years, but um, there was still a strained relationship with Isaac. And when they did in fact leave Harmony in the fall of 1830, Emma never saw her parents again. And this was very troubling to her. When the news that her father had passed away came by her nephew, 
Lorenza Wasson. She um, was so upset and so sad. And she immediately, for the first time, wrote to her mother and told, you know, all about the children that had been born and lost and the places that they lived and invited her mother to come to Illinois. There was great farmland there. And some of her siblings did come. Her mother wasn't in good enough health. She also, when Emma learned about um, baptisms for the dead, she was baptized for both her father and her mother and um, some friends and, and relatives. So um, her family was always really important to her. And I think it's significant that she did in fact lead them to go with Joseph. In fact, that's one of the verses in section 25 is that she would go with Joseph at the time of his going. And she did that. She was committed to him. Okay. So I guess we could summarize by saying that they did not necessarily follow the cultural traditions of the time, but they Absolutely. did what they felt was right in spite of those cultural traditions. Yeah, they both, though, were old enough by New York state law to get married without a parent's consent. Okay, great. But they did elope, sort of. So let's, let's globalize this again. Okay. Homelessness is a problem around the world, and some people feel as though they can never be happy unless they own a home. Tell us about Emma and whether or not she had a home over the course of her marriage to Joseph. That's such a good question, and I think, I think it's interesting to trace that, um, her, all the different places she lived, right? So when she was married, she lived with the Smith family, and then they came and lived for a short time with her family, and then they were able to fix up a, a home close to her family in Harmony. Joseph purchased the land, and um, then they moved to the Whitmer farm, and then they moved to Kirtland, where they lived with the Whitney family. Um, and it wasn't until 1834 in Kirtland that they had their own house. Um, so they, uh, their first house was in Harmony that they owned. Their second house was in Kirtland, but we know they had to leave Kirtland. Um, and then when they came across to, uh, from Missouri back to Illinois, um, they lived in what, was, what is now called the Smith Homestead, a small home that had already existed. By 1843, the mansion house is completed. And this is finally a place where Emma can set down roots. I mean, she's always planted gardens and, and taken care of her children, but this is a place that feels permanent to them. And I think for that reason, when the, the body of the saints left Nauvoo and she refused to go because she was concerned about how she was gonna provide for her family, that sense of insecurity of not having a home was a very heavy one for Emma. And she, um, even when she, before Joseph died, when they were in discussion about plural marriage and she worried about how his properties might be divided among his wives, she um, demanded that he transfer some of the titles of his properties to her name and to her children's names. It was so important to her to have a home and to have a place where she could be, um, where she could feel safe and safely raise her children. So it's interesting that that was sort of a battle with her and Brigham. Of course, the Smith family finances were so intricately um, tied up with the church's finances. They weren't separated at all, but um, they were able to come to some sort of conclusion and she was able to keep the mansion house and the homestead. Um, and she actually stayed there. Lewis Vitamin later used the bricks that had been left from building the Nauvoo house and built what's called the Riverside Mansion. And they moved into the Riverside Mansion, which was very close. It was right on the river, obviously. Um, and she was secure for the rest of her life. And that was really important to her. And so in that sense, I think that a home provides an incredible sense of security and safety for families. But during Joseph's life, she was, I guess, living with others as frequently as she had her own home. Is that correct? Yeah. In fact, I love this story. When, Like I said, when they first moved to Kirtland, they lived with Newell Kay and Elizabeth Ann Whitney. Um, when they came back to Commerce, which later became Nauvoo, Illinois, 
um, the Whitney's came and they had lost everything. And so the Whitney's lived with the Smiths. And I love that they had that relationship where they were able to um, reciprocate and care for one another. I also love that Emma's home all, almost always was filled with people other than her family. She in Kirtland boarded um, worker, people working on the construction of the Kirtland temple. And then in Nauvoo, she welcomed orphans and um, other families into her home. So her home had like this revolving door. It was open to everyone. And I think that was part of her personality, um, part of her generosity as a, as a woman and as a, the role of um, first lady of the church, um, but also because she wanted to share what she had, that she had finally achieved this plot of land with a home on it, a place where she could also entertain diplomats and have parties and stuff like that. So that was extremely important to her. Great. Well, this is probably a good time to segue to an audience question. Here's the question. What was the relationship between Emma and Lucy Max Smith, particularly after Joseph Smith was killed? That's a really good question. Um, Emma, in, she spoke, Emma spoke in the 1945, 1845, conference, which was held outside of the Nauvoo Temple, and um, Brigham Young had asked her to, to stand up and speak, and, and her speech is actually recorded in the book At the Pulpit. It's kind of a wandering recap of, of her family history and of church history, and she actually says that she will go west with the saints, um, but she decides not to, and I think part of that is her need to be near the bodies of her husband, um, Joseph and Hiram, Samuel and Don Carlos, who were all buried in Nauvoo. Um, Sam Brown talks a little bit about the importance of being buried or with your buried family. Um, also, she's not well, she's not in good health. She lived with Emma for a while there, and then she moved in with a daughter, but then at the end of her life, she came and lived with Emma and Emma took care of her. They had a very close relationship. And I think part of that is because Emma had left her mother, her own mother, that she, who she loved dearly. And Lucy sort of became a surrogate mother. Um, Lucy notes that when the first missionaries were sent out, that Emma did everything that she could to clothe them and pre prepare them for the mission. She was pregnant at the time and she became so weary and exhausted because she gave everything to that preparation and to that role. Um, and there's also another beautiful quote by Lucy about how Emma was um, always worked so hard with um, taking care of the people and ministering to them, caring for them when they were sick, um, feeding them or housing them. And she, they had a deep love for each other. Great. Here's another audience question. The book implies that Joseph may have had some physical relationships with some of his other wives. Did he? It's a good question. I don't know. Um, there are a few references to that. Of course, they're given later on, um, um, long after Joseph had died. Um, I, Zina Young said that she was his wife in very deed. Um, so I don't know. And there's also um, William Clayton's journal seems to indicate that there was some kind of physical relationship or that Joseph and one of his plural wives spent the night together. Um, so we know that. We don't know much more beyond that. Like I said, not only is this a time period in which people don't talk about sex unless it's in a vulgar or gossipy way, but they, we also know that um, they just didn't keep those kinds of records. Joseph required confidentiality and um, a covenant to keep these things sacred or secret. And as a result, I think Emma took that um, very far. Um, in fact, never telling her children about it. Let me ask a follow-up question. Okay. It's been intriguing to me over the years that you have Joseph who practiced plural marriage and Brigham Young after him who practiced plural marriage. Mm -hmm. People seem to be 
adjusted to the idea of Brigham Young practicing plural marriage and fathering children and so forth. Mm -hmm. uh, and there doesn't seem to be as much concern or question about that as there is with Joseph and the possibility of having physical relationships with his, with his wives. Mm -hmm. Why do you think that distinction exists? I think part of it exists because um, there's a shift in location. They've left Nauvoo where they were uh, politically and socially and religiously persecuted um, and they lived in fear. They left and lived in a place where they felt comfortable in living the way that they had wanted to in Nauvoo, but couldn't. And um, as a result, it was much more public. We know in 1852, the idea of polygamy was expressly given over the pulpit. And we also know that before that, like in winter quarters, women began to live as the wives of their plural husbands. But um, it was it was such a, a unacceptable way of living that um, I think it was adverse to that time period. I think as they the further west they moved, the more progressive they became, and um, became more it became more well known. Okay, here's another question from the audience: What was Emma's role in the founding of the RLDS Church? That's a good question. Um, Emma actually fought against the, the RLDS church. There were two men, and I'm going to tell you right now, one of them, I think, was M William McClellan. Do you remember, Rick? Yes, she did have a, she did have a close uh, contact with William McClellan. Yeah, and he was one of the founders, I think, initial founders of the RLDS church. Does that ring a bell to you? Well, he, had, he started early on sort of casting about trying to figure out a way of going back to what he thought the church should be. Right. Um, when you talk about the founding, you, you have to sort of go back to this period between when the saints who went west left Nauvoo and then those who stayed in the Midwest began communicating with each other and coming up with, with questions. And there's sort of this sort of formative period. He's part of that formative Okay, thank you. I sort of feel like I'm having my oral exams. <laughs> I You're love doing it. Great. It's great. I love it. Um, but there were also several other breakoffs well before the Saints left Nauvoo um, with Sidney Rigdon and his breakoff with um, William String, William um, Smith, even kind of waffled. Uh, but there were a lot of questions about who should be the next prophet, the succession crisis, if you will. But um, several times the men who believed that Joseph Smith III should be the next prophet following his father's death came to Nauvoo and to Emma and Joseph III and neither one of them initially wanted to have anything to do with it. I think Emma probably was um, understandably exhausted and just sort of needed a break. Um, and it wasn't until 1860 that they came back and they said, will you please pray about this? And Joseph III did, and he said, okay, I'll do it. They wore him down, I guess. And so he and his mother went to Plano, I believe it was. And um, he was the, there ordained a, the president of the RLDS church. Neither one of them were baptized because they had been previously baptized, um, but they became from then on out active members of that church. Okay. In fact, Emma, there's a letter that Emma writes to her son, Joseph III, where there's a small branch in Nauvoo and it's called the Olive Branch, which I think is awesome. And they met in the red brick store in Nauvoo. And she wrote to her son saying she, would, she wanted to provide funding to the bishop of this branch um, to help with missionary work. So she was always engaged in, in the church and the going on, goings on, going on, whatever was going on. <laughs> okay, another audience question. Was there a certain event that started the tension between Brigham Young and Emma, or was it just built up over time? I don't know the answer to that, but my guess is knowing um, a little bit about both of them is that it had built up over time. Now, Brigham Young's first wife had passed away. His second wife was Mary Ann Angel, and that was his wife um, in the later part of Nauvoo. She and Emma were very different. She was very much of an introvert 
And Emma was kind of the opposite of that. She was an extrovert. She loved people. She loved people in her home. Um, she loved entertaining. Um, for reasons that I have not been able to find, Marianne Young never joined the Nauvoo Relief Society. Um, I also think that Joseph was much more progressive in his view of women and the way that they participated in society and in this, um, the temple and in the church and um, in leadership and relief society. And Brigham, would, I think, was much more conservative, New England conservative. And so I think he felt maybe a little threatened by Emma and her um, assertive leadership. We know that um, when Brigham Young was not in Nauvoo, when Joseph was killed, he was back east on a mission. And when he came back in August, um, I think that he, you would think that he would go visit Emma and pay his condolences. But the first time he goes to see Emma, he asks, he goes and demands the um, Joseph's Nauvoo Legion uniform and his horse because the Nauvoo Legion's going to muster. And it just wasn't a very, I don't know, genteel or thoughtful way of, of saying hey to Emma at the time. She said no way on the uniform. But she let him take his horse and Joseph III writes about how he took the horse, they did the muster, and then the um, his clerk took the horse and just ran it into the ground and, and the horse was never the same again. So there was a lot of um, emotion about that. Animals are very well loved in the Smith home. They had a dog that they loved and their horses that they loved. Also, uh, Emma and Joseph, or Emma and Brigham certainly argued about Joseph's papers. Emma wanted them for herself, her husband's papers. Brigham wanted them for the for the church and the history of the church. Um, and there was concern about the persecution that continued to go on in Nauvoo. At one point, Brigham set guards at the mansion house where Emma lived, and that felt very uh, claustrophobic to Emma. She was very uncomfortable with that. Also, Brigham wanted to take Joseph's body, Joseph and Hiram's bodies to Utah to bury, and Emma wasn't about to let that happen. So she she moved the bodies and didn't even, and Brigham Young didn't even know where they were. So there's a lot of things. Another audience question. Do you have any knowledge about Emma's relationship with Hiram Smith and Mary Fielding in Nauvoo? Oh, you, this is such a good question. Um, I think I think they were close. I'm going to say they were close. We don't have a lot of records. We know that um, on December 12th, 1843, when Hiram asked if he if Joseph could write down the revelation on plural marriage, he said, I'm, "I have a pretty good." Hiram says, "I have a pretty good relationship with Emma. I can take it to her, and I think she'll accept it." And Joseph said, oh, my brother, you have no idea who Emma is. Um, and so that may have been a problem, a thorn in the relationship, so to speak. Um, I don't necessarily know what the relationship with Emma and Mary Fielding Smith was. I do know that when they buried Joseph and Hiram, the public burial was really just sand in the casket and they had put their bodies under the Nauvoo house. And together they had planned to move the body somewhere else. And the night that they were going to do that, Emma sent word to Mary and said, we're not doing it tonight. And so Mary said, okay. Well, Mary woke up in the middle of the night, something woke her up and she went outside to get some fresh air and she saw them moving the bodies. So I can imagine that there might've been some tension there um, about not being involved in that. We also know that her, Mary's son, um, Joseph F. passed through Nauvoo um, on his way east or on his way back and wanted to see his cousins and his aunt. And um, it was kind of a, also a tense relationship. So that's all I know about them. I wish I knew more. I love Mary Fielding Smith. I, wanted, I would love to learn more about her. Thank you very much. Next question. In your opinion, what is the best or most thoroughly researched book on plural marriage in the early church? Oh boy. That's a good question. 
I think, um, let's look at it in a couple of different ways. I think that volume one of Saints, volume one and volume two of Saints um, pre present very fair and um, accurate depictions of plural marriage in a narrative style. Um, there are several others. Um, ones that come to mind are Todd Compton, um, his book on Joseph Smith's wives in Sacred Loneliness is what it's called. Um, I don't like his footnotes. I think Richard Bushman does a good job in Rough Stone Rolling. But there are also books by uh, the, about the Utah period by Catherine Danes. Um, and I believe she and Sally Gordon are working on sort of a what happens with the manifesto. Um, um, what's his name? Brian Hale has written a four volume collection of uh, plural marriage and he presents some interesting ideas. It's so much easier to document the Utah practice of polygamy than it is the Nauvoo practice of polygamy simply because we have contemporary records. Um, and so the, the Nauvoo period is a little ambiguous to say the least. Do you I have any very, books you would add in, Rick? No, I think that last statement is an extremely important one for people to understand. A lot of times people think that history can answer all questions. History as a discipline can answer mm -hmm. all questions. And we, we all know the famous statement that we, we learned a long time ago that of all the things that ever happened, only a few are ever observed. And of those that are observed, only a few are are recorded and of those that are recorded only a few of the records survive and of those records that survive only a few are found and of the ones that are found only a few are read and by the time you you filter down the evidence that remains from history what you discover is that a lot of times you can't answer questions through the discipline of history there's simply not enough evidence that exists i know one very prominent latter day saint scholar who wanted to write about the early history of plural marriage, a very prominent scholar. And ultimately, after looking at all of the available information, she concluded it could not be done because there was not adequate information. So I know that's frustrating sometimes to members of the general public to think that you can't necessarily answer all the questions, but the reality is that there's very little information about the early practice of plural marriage of a contemporaneous nature. There are reminiscences Brian Hales and others do a good job of pulling those together for, for people to interpret themselves. Yeah, and I would add, um, I believe Kathleen Flake is still working on her book about, it was about Mormon matriarchy. I don't know what her, but she's she's done, she has a website that shows um, some of these networks and neighborhoods, you could say of where polygamy happened in Nauvoo and how that fed into further family and church relationships. So that's also, I believe, it will be in a very important book. I think she's done some of the very best work in, in trying to gather all of the documentation. Mm -hmm. We have more audience questions, but we've, we're reaching the end of our period. I want to give you a chance to answer one additional question that we talked about before this event. And that is, how is the life of Emma Smith a story of redemption? And then I'll wrap up after that. Oh gosh, this is such a great question. I'm so glad you asked this, Rick. I'm going to go back to section 25 to answer that question. Um, I think it's really interesting that the Lord establishes his relationship with Emma, his daughter, um, after she's been baptized, where she literally, we would consider today in our church that she has become a daughter of, of, of the Savior. Um, and he tells her that, that she will... Um, receive an inheritance, that she can receive an inheritance and a crown of righteousness. And he says at the end, if, unless you do these things, you shall not be in, you shall not be able to come into my presence. And he gives her some very specific things, counsel, like um, pride and lay aside the things of the world, be meek, um, don't complain pretty much, be a comfort to Joseph. Um, and and I, I think that maybe many people would think that because she didn't come um, west, that she 
didn't keep her end of that bargain. She never spoke of her temple covenants. She was the first woman to be endowed, and I think that's significant. And she then passed that endowment on to other women. But I think one way that we can see that redemption in a very beautiful, personal, intimate um, account is, is a story that is told of shortly before her death, where she has a dream. And she, um, Joseph comes to her in the dream and he takes her to a beautiful mansion and inside the mansion is a nursery and in, in the nursery is a, a cradle with her son, Don Carlos, who had died when he was 14 months old of malaria. And she was so excited to see her baby. She picked him up and she turned to Joseph and said, where are the others? And he said, you will have them all, every one of them. And then she turned in her dream and saw the savior, Jesus Christ. And I think that is the perfect explanation of her redemption, that she in fact was in his presence and that she had kept her covenants, cleaved under her covenants and that she would be exalted. I think it's interesting that both Brigham and Eli's, or Emma, the last words that they said, Brigham when he died in 1877 and Emma when she died in 1879, they both said, Joseph, Joseph, Joseph indicating that he had come for them. And I think that is beautiful. And I hope that she and Brigham have reconciled. Well. Thank you, Dr. Jennifer Reeder for being our guest this evening. And thanks to our audience for tuning into tonight's conversation. We remind you again of next month's conversation dealing with the Missouri period of Latter-day Saint history. And finally, we invite you to revisit tonight's conversation and any of the previous ones by tuning into the John A. Witzel Foundation website, www.witzelfoundation.org. Thank you for listening and good night. <laughs>